everybody. It's Amber, and today we're doing something a little different. Yep, I'm in my kitchen. Shocking, I know. It took me four hours to get the disaster of just dry goods that needed to be put away, put away. So, um, I am just about ready to show you how to make my great-grandmother's potato soup, which I call oyster chowder, but it's not thick. So, if you can hang on for me a minute, I'm going to change tops so I do not get stuff all over my new sweatsuit. And I'll be right back. Alright, I wanted to change because that is the pretty purple sweatsuit that my husband got me for Christmas. And I love it and it's so comfy and if I got anything on it, I would feel terrible and he would be very upset. So, he's sitting right here. Um, this is an, a simple recipe, guys. It really is. It has very few ingredients. But a couple of the ingredients, you've got to be very, very, very specific about what you buy. Oh my God. The potatoes have to be russet potatoes because you need the starch for this soup to work. All right. I have tried it with everything shy of fingerling potatoes and because those are very waxy. Nothing works in this except for good old russet potatoes. Now, I buy... Idaho potatoes, because we want to support our U.S. farmers. That's, you guys being homesteaders and farmers, you should understand, if people don't buy what you grow, we don't keep our farmlands going. So you're going to hear my husband dealing with my grandson, because he's having his dinner, because I just don't picture him liking this soup. Um, so what I've got here is approximately 10 pounds. Now, guys, this is at least a double batch at least and it's because my father-in-law loves it my daughter loves it my husband loves it I love it and this is a treat for me I don't get to eat starchy foods because they cause pain but because I already did a bunch of stuff today that I'm going to be in pain tomorrow no matter what I do I might as well enjoy the soup because it'll help my cold so, you want to be specific about the potatoes, and here's the other thing, guys. It takes evaporated milk in this recipe. Do not, please do not, I have made this mistake myself, do not try to use any brand other than Carnation. They have a different flavor, and they are not as rich. And you do not want condensed milk. That's sweet. You want this. Okay, guys? Carnation evaporated vitamin D added milk. Okay, now we're doing the vitamin D added because we have a grandbaby, we have puppies, one of whom is pregnant, so we need that extra vitamin D. And I'm no longer allowed to be out in the sun a lot, so again, need the vitamin D. Now, I'm going to have my witness and, and taste tester here. He didn't like oysters when I met him. Okay, and he didn't like oysters when we got married, 17 years later. He didn't realize that oysters went in his soup, and he ate it and fell in love with the soup. And he likes oysters this way, I believe, Kevin? I do. So, and I do not, I've done it with fresh oysters. I would love to get to do that every time. But guys, I can't afford to do that. They are insanely expensive in Arizona. So, I go with, again, my great-grandmother's way whole canned oysters. Do not drain the juice. You need that for this soup. Okay? Those work best. These are boiled <clears throat> in water. Okay? So what you've got in here is the oyster liquor and water and that is important to the flavor of the soup. I know it sounds funny, but please trust me and give it a try because I'm not, I won't eat oysters any other way. I don't like slimy food. So, that's why I don't eat okra. So, and then we've got, I can't tell you how many pounds because I'm not the one who bought the onions. But I've got two huge sweet onions and a little piece of one that we needed to use up, but we love onion, so it's going in. It's about four pounds. It's about four pounds of sweet onion, okay? My grandma always used the old brown onions. I like the sweet onions better. That one, you can work with what you want on it, okay? But it needs to have a brown skin on it. White and red onions do not taste good in this soup. It just doesn't. 
So I'm going to put you on hold for a second while I get the potatoes out of the pan because I have them sitting in water so they don't oxidize. And then cut them up. I'll show you about how big you cut them up. We'll put them on the boil. Okay? So I'll see you in a minute. So let me let you understand the, what's going on here. This right here is a 12-quart stock pot. Okay? Now, that is what I'm making the soup in because I have to do so much of it. However, this is a normal soup pot. And yes, this one looks all raggedy for a very good reason. This was my grandma's. And there is nothing that cooks stew and spaghetti like that pot. It works better than anything I have. And I have cast iron, but it works better. So, and this pot... My grandma's pot is just about half full of chopped onion. And when I say chopped, okay, everything in this goes in around bite-sized pieces. So I cut the potatoes to about an inch to an inch and a half pieces. And I cut the onions down to about an inch pieces. Okay, so that is a lot of onion, but that's a lot of soup, guys. Because I'm sure half of it's going to Kevin's dad. And if not, it'll go in Kevin. Which is just fine with me. So, I have my potatoes sitting in water because russets tend to oxidize. And if they do, guys, don't worry about it. Just rinse them off under rubbing water, or running water while you're rubbing them. And the brown comes right off. It's just the starches in it oxidizing. So, for the potatoes, I tend to grab a lot of... When you get to the end of a bag of potatoes, you've got all these little potatoes, okay? Like this one. And everybody goes, what do I do with that? That's too small. No, it's great for doing soups and stews, guys. That's exactly the right potatoes for doing this. Yeah, you got to peel a little more, but that's what you use them for. When you get those, make a pot of soup. Seriously. It works great. So, I'm cutting one of these before I put you on pause, because you guys know I don't have editing software. Um, so, you can see about how big I cut the pieces of the potato that go in this soup. I want you to understand, uh, the guys, these are bite size, okay? And that's what you want, because you don't want anybody to have to choke on their food. Granted, it's going to be very soft, but it's still the point of it. That's how she made it. That's how I make it, okay? She was 86 years old when she died in 1978. Her mom invented this recipe, okay? So this recipe is probably close to 150 years old. Thank you. And my dad always said, if it's not broken, <coughs> don't fix it. Don't try to fix this soup. It is literally probably the most delicious no. chowder or potato soup type food you no. will ever, ever have in your life. Um, I'm sure all of you have great recipes for potato soups. But... Something like this is a little different because it's not thick and the only seasonings in it are sea salt and black pepper. That's it. That's it, guys. So you now know all the ingredients. Now that's the amounts, right? That's what you got to know. So for a normal batch, you're going to use probably one to, to one and a half, depending on your love of onions, <coughs> big onions. <coughs> we like the sweet ones. This recipe does great with the regular brown onions also because they didn't have sweet onions back in those days. So, and that will go to five pounds of potatoes. Okay? So, I'm going to chop these up and we're going to put these on the stove so they can boil. And I'll be back after I get it started so I can tell you a little bit more about how this soup came about. Okay? Okay, guys. Um, about halfway, please. Halfway? Yeah. All right. I finished cutting up all these potatoes. Guys, these are not going to be perfect. They're not supposed to be perfect. Okay? There's going to be some that are skinny, some that are big, but it's about making them bite size. Okay? It's the way it works. This is that big five-quart pot, and it's over full. That's why we're doing it in the big stock pot. Plus, my cutting board... Okay. 
covered in more potatoes. That's why I said. This is really a double batch from what my great-grandmother did. This is my grandmother Isaac's recipe. Great-grandmother Isaac, but we just called her grandmother. Sweetie, I need that pot here to put the goodies into it first. My husband is so sweet. He knows I cannot lift this 12-quart stock pot. There's, it just is never going to occur without hurting me. I would drop it. And then I would be very angry with myself. And that's not ever good. So what you want to do is put all of your potatoes and all of your onions into the water. And I start with hot water because she started with hot water. That's what that is. It brings it to a... I know. Because you already knew. <laughs> it brings it to a boil faster. We're not doing eggs, guys. Eggs, you start with cold water. Potatoes, you don't need to. And I'm trying to cook off a little excess starch because of my fibromyalgia. For most of you, you don't need to worry about that. I do. So, uh, what I'm doing is we've got 10 pounds of potatoes, at least, maybe 11 or 12. Um, doesn't, they were, it's just, I had two 10 pound bags of potatoes and I used over half of one and a little under half of another, <laughs> so it comes out to about 10 pounds. Um, so you're putting all your, and I've got four pounds of, of sweet onions cut up the same way, bite size, guys. And it's all going, oh my goodness, no. going in the giant pot. Sorry, Dante stepped on one of my puppies again. If you can't tell, I call him Dante when I'm not happy with him. Sweetie, can you put this in there? Because I'm going to splash it everywhere. All right, go ahead. I'm not afraid of the hot water. Our water heater is brand new. Our, our original one decided to commit suicide. Um, which would not be good with fibromyalgia. And so, because I have to soak in hot baths. And so, we got a brand new water heater. And my husband being as sweet as he is and knowing my disorder. Just, oh, don't let her get that. Just rinse it off. Um, he had them set it to 160 degrees. Ow. So that I can get a hot bath. The problem is, my husband's a little more temperature sensitive than I am. So it I'm gets a big there. baby. Is what he's it not. Is. He's a delicate flower. He's not a big baby. Okay, so you're gonna bring. You're gonna make sure you've got. It needs a little more, just in case. You want to not just cover your potatoes and onions, guys. You want to give yourself a couple, three, four inches of water beyond that. You want this to be able to move. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna bring it to a boil. Turn it down a little bit to where it's kind of a high simmer, but not boiling. Enough. That's perfect. And until the potatoes are fork tender. All right? So I will be back when that happens and my stove gets pretty hot pretty quick. So um, I will talk to you all when that has come to a boil, simmered, and gotten fork tender. And I'll let you know how long it takes for 12 quarts of liquid and potatoes and onions to do that. So I'll see you in a bit. Okay, guys, since we're waiting, I had mentioned that I would tell you the story behind this soup because it's a really neat story. It really is. My great-grandmother, Isaac, came over to Arizona in a covered wagon as a little girl. Hold on a moment, please. Grandson wants to be right next to my husband. I don't want him in the kitchen when we've got, you know, pans boiling and things that could go sideways and he could get hurt very easily. So he got upset because I made him leave the kitchen and my husband has got him now. So, the story behind this is my great-grandmother Isaac, all right, was, and I'm adopted, so this is my legal mother's side of the family. She was an abusive witch, but my great-grandmother was the neatest lady. Very strong, very sturdy, to the point, and nobody dared mess with this lady. Um, the Isaac family was one of the two families that originally established civilization in Phoenix, other than Native Americans, okay? So, before she was an Isaac, because <laughs> she married into it, um, she was brought over from Kansas on a covered wagon with her parents and siblings. From what I understand, she was eight or nine years old, okay? And they had to move out here. Well, they couldn't bring their dairy cow. They were unable to bring it out here. It didn't, 
it wouldn't have made the trip. Not safe. Protect your puppies. So, having to sell their cow. My great great grandmother, and no, I do not know what the name is, um, did a bunch of milk up as evaporated milk so that they could transport it that long distance and still have milk for their kids. I know there's a process, I just don't know how to do it, and that's okay with me. So, it's actually less expensive nowadays to buy it. <coughs> so, they had... Hold on, please. This is not working well. Hey guys, I have protected puppies, a three-year-old grandson. One of my babies is pregnant, so just a lot all at once. So if, if I get interrupted, I'm so sorry. So anyway, she had evaporated all this milk, and um, along the way, they went across the coast somewhere and got oysters. And she cooked them up and canned them. And so they had onions, and they had potatoes. And they were getting really, really, really low on food. And so, this is pretty much all they had. They were not in an area where they could hunt. I'm going to go close the front door. I will be right back. Down to some of the last of their supplies. So, my great-great-grandmother put together the last onion she had, the last few potatoes they had, and these oysters... A little salt and a little pepper, and there was born the soup. Now, yeah, there's a couple of tricks to it, but that was how the soup was born. And it, I guess it was during a time when one of the kids was very, very ill, and it really helped make them better from the extra iodine in the oysters and all of that. So it really did help a lot. Well, then when World War I hit... Or World War Two, I'm not sure which. Um, you know, carnation evaporated milk was what was available. You, you know, you couldn't get the supplies. And my great grandmother Isaac's and great grandfather Isaac's cow just didn't make enough milk for them to take care of their son, themselves, and to make the soup. So. And condense it down and do it the way her mom had done it. So she started buying the carnation evaporated milk and she liked the flavor better and it stuck. It's part of the family recipe. But this has been, yeah, probably close to 150 years of this in our family. And even the Rendleman side of my family absolutely loved this soup. And they loved my great-grandmother very much. They just, they all got along very well. So when she passed, it was, it was quite a, a hit to our family. But we had her food left, you know. We had her recipes, and through that, she lives on. So I'm going to go back to letting you hold while I check on the pot, and we'll go from there. I just wanted to let you guys know there was a very special and neat story behind this food. And it's part of the reason that it carries on in our family. Because it saved our family's life. It did. And that's just what it is. Saucy and bit. So, you know, you don't want potatoes or anything on the bottom to get burned. You need them to be cooked nicely. But when I looked, there's so much that my grandma Rendleman's pot, the funny looking brown one, and that big 12-quart stock pot are going to be full of soup because there's no way I'm getting anything else in that pot. It's just not going to happen. So it's going to fill both pots, which is kind of neat because then that makes enough for my father-in-law and daughter um, and for us to have lots and lots. Now, let me tell you, this soup freezes very well. It just does. Um... So it is something that you can put into your stockpile. You can can this soup um, if you have the, the means to can food. My great-grandmother did it for years. Um, but when she passed away, I was so little and they got rid of her things. So I didn't get any of her canning supplies, sadly. 
Um, so I don't have a way to can anything. It's just not in our budget, guys. I wish to God we could, but pressure canners and water bath canners are so expensive. And we're trying to support, you know, two extra people right now. So that's not within our normal means. And it's, it's draining us pretty well. Um, so we're doing what we have to do. So if you guys can figure out a way for me to can things without anything really specialized, please let me know. I would love to know. Because we've got prickly pear cactus nearby that grows beautiful fruit. And I know how to make prickly pear and jalapeno jelly, which is, oh my goodness, good. That fruit, if you know how to fix it, is so good. I come from being raised by Native Americans. So, you know, my my great-grandmother on my dad's side was, was from the Cherokee Nation in the Appalachians. So, this is my heritage as far as my growing up. Genetically, I am full-blooded Sicilian. So, but the genetics aren't really what matter when it comes to things like this. This is love. This is heritage. This is family. This is memories. This is how we keep them alive in our hearts. You know, I can't see these people until it's my time. And so in the meantime, I'll just keep cooking their food and pass it down to my family. That's all I know to do. But yeah, it's going to end up being, let's see, 12 plus 5. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be end up being about 17 quarts of soup. Believe it or not, that will not make it for more than four days. Nope. Failure at all. It'll be gone. I'll get one or two bowls. That's it. That's how it works. <laughs> so if you want something that you can get your family to eat that's pretty much after you cut up the stuff, it does its own thing, this is it. And it doesn't take long to make. So, I'll talk to you after a while. Two things. I have the most considered husband on the planet. Um, you guys know I'm a coffeeaholic. That's my addiction. I'm sitting here cooking. It's cold in the house. What's he do? Makes a fresh pot of coffee for me. Really? But I want to show you a neat trick. Now, my grandma used to do this. And I guess I had forgotten about it. My grandma Rendleman did, um, but a friend of mine that's a chef always did this in their restaurant. The handles on the side of pots, I'm trying to do this without it steaming up. Okay, you see that? How it's the spoon is in there? All right. The handles on the side of your pots are designed so that you can put cooking size spoons in them and they don't get hot, even when they're all metal like this one. They don't get hot. It's a really neat trick that keeps you from making a mess that you don't need um, or setting spoons on your stove or any of that. But yeah, you just look at this. It's a really cool thing. And I just thought, you know, maybe some of you might not know that pots are designed this way, guys. They, when they manufacture them, let me bring you around. They're actually, yeah, you can see my KitchenAid. They're actually designed to do that right there. Okay. So, that is really, I think it's one of the coolest tips for people who cook in big pans and stuff like that. Now, pans like this one, with the solid handles, okay, you see that? They're designed so they're slightly rounded, and you can set the spoon on them with the handle down. Now, this funny looking old brown pot, my grandma got this when they came to Phoenix back in the late 60s. It was the first of the Teflon pots that came out. Now, all the Teflon's gone from it over the years from scrubbing it, and, you know, that's how my grandma was. But I got to tell you, there's no better pot pan for doing, you know, enough soup for three or four people for one meal or a pot of spaghetti, American style. Kevin, is there 
out of all the pans we have, and we have some really good pans. I use that one the most. He likes my grandma's. Okay. And my husband does a lot of the cooking around here since I got sick. Now, when we first got married, he worked two jobs. So when he would get home two. from the first job, school, okay, before he would go two. to umpire, all right, I would have dinner so that within 15 minutes of him coming home, getting a chance to settle down, wash up and change clothes, dinner was on the table. Right, Kevin? Yep. I had to be sick, sick, sick for that not to happen. Or it was one of our, what my dad called scrounge nights, which means you've got so many leftovers in the fridge, you need to use them up. The kids are old enough to microwave their own food. I don't know how to do this. There you go. The so, you know, that's how that works. So my sweetie went off, made me a pot of coffee that I didn't know he was doing. And we ended up, we're going to have so much soup, it's going to be about 17 quarts of soup at least. So yeah, definitely, I know we're made stuffy. that's okay. I, I can definitely tell you that that 12-quart pot, that man right there, and one of our kids, any of our kids, one of our kids, along with our pups, because we give them the broth off of it, we do not feed them the potatoes, um, is gone within a couple of days. It's gone. <clears throat> it just doesn't last. This is that kind of soup. Now, if you hate oysters, okay, you hate them. Just nasty. No matter what you do, you can't eat them. Guys, you can put canned clams in this. I don't like clams. All right? Or you can do what we had to do, my great-grandmother had to do a couple of times. She couldn't get a hold of oysters at the time because they just weren't readily available. Um, and she did it without them. Oh, my goodness. And so she would make a roux and put it in there after everything had boiled. And thicken it up just a little bit. The potatoes cause the thickening naturally. Okay? So, I'm just letting you know. There are options to it. But this is the way I was taught to make it. And this is how I make it. And everybody that I've ever met that has tried it has loved it. So, even my father-in-law who doesn't like anything I do. He loves this soup. So... You guys going to be holding for a little bit because it's almost time to split this into two pots. And I need your help. All right, guys. So because everybody's stove settings are different, a lot of you are lucky enough to have gas or wood. I'm not. This house is what is set up for gas. But it's all electric. But it's all electric and it pisses me off. Okay. So I wanted to show you the rate of simmer that you want on this pot because pretty soon it's going to be ready for me to switch. So if it doesn't completely fog up, which it might, guys, you know how it's just, it fogged you up. I'm so sorry. Okay, let me see if I can find the angle here. Hopefully you can see that. I doubt it because it is so steamy. It's hot. I'm trying to catch it quick. All right. That's as close as I'm going to get. I just fogged you all out a few times. That's okay. It was healthy. <laughs> so I told you about this little basket that is really neat for eggs. And it was a gift. It's very, very old. And it was a gift. But I like to put my onions in it. Because if they're not in a bag or something, then they hold up better. So here is this pretty little wire basket. Isn't that gorgeous? I just love that thing. Stuff like that makes me smile. It does. It makes me smile. Because it's old world craftsmanship. Craftsmanship. You get to see... I'm going to sit back down. Because I am sore. I love things like that. I have four cast iron skillets, guys. And an enamel coated cast iron Dutch oven. Because... My original Dutch oven disappeared in the move. So my husband bought me one of the really nice enamel ones. I was admiring them, and I love that pot. <laughs> oh my goodness, do I love that pot. But, you know, I have one cast iron skillet. It was my grandma Rendelman's. It was her mother's from back in the 1800s, late 1800s. So, I love my cast iron, obviously. And... 
it's my all-time favorite thing to cook on. Now, my cutting boards, I'm very spoiled, all right? Not this Christmas that just passed, but the year before, my husband went out and got me a three-pack that he found at Costco of, oh my goodness, we would never be able to order them or afford them separately in our lifetimes. They are Sabatier bamboo cutting boards, but they have these wonderful stoppers, rubber stoppers, on both sides. I'm never going to get anything that nice again in my life. I got a big, huge one. I got this medium one, and then I got one with a handle that's, I guess, designed for bread. Cutting bread. I don't know if any loaves of bread that small. So, I use it when I need to just, you know, dice up an onion and throw it in, and it's, you know, it's something that's going to fit on there. That's what I personally use it for. Because it's easier for me to have the handle and just move into the pot. Because this kitchen is really tiny. And I used to have a huge, huge kitchen that was bigger than my living room in this house. But I can't take care of a house that big anymore. It just, it is what it is. So, <clears throat> yeah, this is, we have very little cabinet space. But after I do this video, I'm going to show you. Because we've been talking about, and well, you guys have been talking about preppers versus homesteaders. Okay, guys, homesteaders prep. We do. That's what we do. Okay, I can't can things right now, but I do keep a lot of canned and boxed goods, and I refresh them. I have more beans than I will ever eat in my lifetime, <clears throat> and rice in my home, because we live between a very prominent Air Force base where they train pilots for Israel, the Navy, and all the desert wars that they're fighting. They train their pilots out here. And on the other end are underground missile silos. Yeah. Okay. There's also an army base in Arizona, but it's in Williams. It's way on the other end. I'm not even, it would take a nuclear war for me to get hit by that one. <coughs> so I'm in a location where I need to make sure that if something goes sideways and our streets are closed off, my family's got food. So I have made those preparations years ago. Because I grew up near this Air Force Base, guys. I know. I trained at that Air Force Base. I know that we are a top target. It's been announced by the government when 9-11 when happened. They were concerned about Luke Air Force Base getting hit. It's a prime target. And with the planes that are there, it would have downed a good chunk of our military force. Thank God it didn't happen. So, yeah, we. I will be showing you that, yeah, I do prepare. I won't call myself a prepper. I don't even call myself a homesteader, guys, even though technically I live as one. But, guys, I'm just the next generation of what my family did. And I have so much pride in the things that they taught me because they're old ways and they're the, the good ways, the, the ways that make sense to me. They're healthy. It's, I never grew up on fast food. It, you know, that was, to get pizza was a major treat. We didn't live like that. And I didn't raise my children like that. I raised them the way I was raised. And now we're raising our grandson that way. Home cooked as much from scratch as I can physically manage because obviously I don't know how to evaporate milk and fresh oysters are too expensive. But everything else, guys, this is this is from scratch, all right? And I'm about to learn how to bake bread and that is Heather at Needy Homesteader's fault. I'm not mad at you, hon. I'm just teasing. But I'm going to need some guidance because I have this beautiful mixer. Um... And I use it for a lot of things, but I've never made bread in it. And I haven't even seen bread being made since I was six. So, we're going to give it a shot. It just won't be tonight, because I can only do so much at once, guys. I wanted to make my eggplant parmesan tonight, too, but after all the organizing and cleaning, I just don't have it in me to do today. So, I'm hoping and praying that tomorrow will be an okay day, which... I'm probably going to be in bed, but 
within the next couple of days or I'm going to lose the eggplant. And my husband won't even try it. Because there's an art to making eggplant not taste bitter. So, I'm going to pause again. I know this is going to be a long video, guys, but you're staying with me pretty much the whole time it's cooking. If I pause you, it's only for a minute or so. This is, because I want you to understand, this is a quick meal. This is a quick meal. You all have farm animals and everything else. This is a good quick meal. Okay? So you're about, you're going to find it out, but I'm pausing you so I don't have to move you around and jostle you around all the time. So I can check my pot because I'm pretty sure it's ready to split. Okay guys, here we go. Now I paused you long enough to check and my potatoes are and onions are ready. So I split off about somewhere between a fourth and a third of the potatoes and onions into my grandma's pot, which is right here. Okay. I'm trying to see this upside down. Alright? So you can see about how much is in there. But the thing is, you need some of the water off of the potatoes and onions for the starch. So we have my handy Winnie the Pooh cup, which is a huge coffee mug. And it will take... I'm glad I have almost Teflon hands because that steam is hot. Okay, I'm going to tell you about how many of those cupfuls. <laughs> Should be about two. So it's enough that you want to cover your vegetables. And beyond that, you don't need the broth. Hey, that was just two. <clears throat> okay, so I got lucky and had just the right amount of broth. I'm going to take a little more because I just think it's a better idea. All right. So I'm going to pause you while I open up the oysters and the evaporated milk. And then I'll show you the next step. Oh, by the way, I've turned my stove down now to medium. Because <clears throat> the next thing is we're going to add this and our salt and pepper. And once all that's hot through, it's ready. This is literally less than 45 minute meal. Other than the peeling of the potatoes. So hang on a minute for me, please. Okay, guys. So here we go. For the so amount of soup I'm making... It's going to sound like a lot, but these cans of oysters are only 8 ounces. Okay, and that includes the liquor in them. Now, when I had kids, I would take a knife inside of the can and cut the oysters up. Because then they didn't notice it so much. But we love them. So, what I'm doing is juice and all. Guys, you need that water. You need it. Honey, can you hold that? Okay, right there. He's being cameraman. You need that liquid off of your oysters, guys. That is a lot of your flavor. A lot of it. So I have eight 8-ounce eight cans for the amount I'm doing, and I'm doing a lot of soup. So you would probably only need four. And that's if you're willing to listen to me and try it my way. Well, my great-grandmother's way. Okay, so I put three in the small pot, and I'm putting five in the giant pot. Because I left the majority of the soup. I do it to where the lid stays on, guys, because... We don't need sharp edges getting anybody cut. Alright, so that's me. We like the whole oysters, so they go in whole. Because we're all grown-ups. <clears throat> Except for Dante, and I don't know if he'll eat this. He'll eat anything. I don't think he'll eat the oyster part. He'll eat this. I hope so. Okay, we do, this is why we do not buy iodized salt in our family. The processed iodized salt is nowhere near what you get and your body digests better from shellfish, guys. Shellfish. That's where you want it. Okay, so that's that part. Then you've got your carnation evaporated milk, which the way I puncture it, I do it with one of those old-time point. There you go. See? And a little one in the back so that it doesn't go glub, glub, glub. All right? For this little pot, because I am using one, two, three, four, five cans, <laughs> Sorry, I'm counting. I have this all. I just know this by heart, guys. I do. I just know it by heart. So that's getting about one and a half cans. It might get a little more, but I doubt it. Because I also do what my great-grandmother did and add a little bit of whole milk at the end to just kind of give it a fresher flavor. So we're at a point now where once all of this goes in, I'm going to show you about how much salt and pepper for the amount of soup. And... 
once that's heated through, it's done, guys. It's done. So you've got less than 45 minutes, other than the peeling potato time, into this meal. <clears throat> and it's an, the small pot will feed a family of four easily and comfortably with some bread or something with it. Hey, we're on the last can. Good deal. So I'm going to put a little bit more of this in that other pot. Not much, though. In the five quart. It just looks to me like it needed a little more richness. Okay, so that's all the canned stuff. Guys, when you keep your preps, when you keep your preps in your cabinet, I advise you keep evaporated milk because if things do go sideways, you've got milk. Okay, you just add water. So we're going to take a little bit of fresh, whole vitamin D milk because if I used 2%, my husband would have me shot. Plus, it's what my great-grandmother did. And I added, this is a half gallon, and you can see to the big pot, I only put about that much in. So about a little bit more to top off the small pot. That just kind of adds a little more freshness to the flavor. I think this big one needs a little bit more. So total for the 17 quarts of soup, we used a quarter of a gallon of milk. Okay? Now I used pure sea salt. I'm very, very, very funny about that. My husband will tell you, he had garlic salt when we got married. It didn't last long for him. And like most of you, I measure my hand, guys. That's how I know. So that is approximately a teaspoon and a half. And it's going in the big pot. And I want about half that amount. Well, less than half that amount. So about half a teaspoon into the little pot. And you do about the same amount of pepper. So I'm going to put you on pause. And then I will come back and show you his reaction. And if he will not fake it, believe me. If he doesn't like something, he tells me. So hold on for me. Okay, guys, let me make a verbal notation here for you. The amount of salt and pepper that I do is what we like taste-wise. Salt and pepper it to your taste. You guys may not like coarse ground pepper. We do. Okay? You may not eat salt. I generally don't. But I do use it in this recipe because it's it tastes better to me. The potatoes soak up the salt. I use this pepper, okay? Coarse ground Malabar black pepper. Reason being, that is a non-GMO organic pepper. Now, I usually use fresh grinders, okay? But this winter has done a number on me, and they had, Costco had a fabulous price on that. So, I mean, that was $3 and some change. And it's a huge thing of pepper. So, we grabbed that up. Yeah, that's about six months worth of pepper, at least maybe longer for us. Mm -hmm. Our favorite seasoning in this house, I'm going to tell you right now. Salt-free garlic and herb. Now, we get the Mrs. Dash from Costco because that's the, it's hard to find garlic garnish, which was the original company that came out with garlic and herb. I remember it because I was at the garlic festival. But we're literally, this is steaming hot. As soon as this comes back up to a, a little simmer or boil you're done it's all done and you just chow down have crackers have a little you know crusty bread since a lot of you make the crusty breads guys this is a healthy healthy meal when you are sick i don't know what it is if it's the oysters or the because vitamin c is richer in onions than it is in oranges or if it's a combination of everything but no matter how sick we get when my father-in-law was in the hospital and his lungs had filled up with mold and fluid, this got him better and got him out of the hospital. It just does. It, it's that particular thing that they knew something we didn't, guys. And it's, it's almost magical. It's almost magical. But you've seen everything that goes into this soup. There is nothing else. It freezes well. My great-grandmother used to can this, like I said. She would make it and then can it, and it was in the cabinet when we wanted it. Because every time I went over there, I wanted it. But I'm weird. So, we'll see you in a minute for the taste test. Probably two to three minutes. Okay? See you then. Okay, guys, so this is what I'm talking about. My husband needed a little more salt. Because potatoes soak up salt. But let me show you what this bowl <laughs> looks like. Okay? If I can get it there. See that? 
that's hearty. It's a hearty soup, guys. It's not a wimpy soup. Let's see how he does. Taste test time. You stay out of the camera, little boy. Mm. Just a little extra salt. Just needed a little more salt? Yep. Other than that, what do you... Excellent. Guys, this is an Irishman who loves his damn potatoes. Do you think people in the South and stuff like that would like potatoes that? Potatoes are nice and soft. You don't have to hardly chew them. That's the way you should have it. Have you had one of the oysters yet? Mm-hmm. I'll let them know right now. See, I leave them nice and big for us because we don't have little kids anymore. <coughs> hot. <laughs> I could have told you it's hot. They're very good. Okay, guys, my husband knows if he doesn't like something, tell me, and he does when he doesn't like something, which I think has only happened twice in our marriage. <clears throat> um, All I had was a little extra salt. Just a little extra salt, and that's, that's to taste, guys. You know, you don't want to over-salt something when you're cooking it because people like me can't have a lot of salt. So that's the end of this video. It's my very first cooking video I put out for you guys, and I hope you like it. Um, I will go down in, in the description part and list the ingredients for you. And beyond that, he's having a little bit of saltines with it. And it won't last long. And he's 17 quarts of soup, I guarantee you. Won't last long. It won't even make it four days. It won't. Because Two he, for lucky. Two for lucky. He loves this soup. And he has been sick lately. So that was one of the reasons I decided <clears throat> to do this. Because he's got some singing engagements for the coyotes coming up. <laughs> Sorry, my favorite team in the whole world, Arizona Coyotes, guys. You know that. So we will talk to you later. God bless. Our prayers are with you guys. And we're thankful for the prayers you're sending us. Enjoy. Enjoy. There you go. We're out of here for tonight. Bye-bye. <laughs>